Play brings you a collection of true stories of America at work. Fishing on dry land? What kind of a fish story is this? Yet it happens all the time wherever oil wells are drilled. As far as this drilling rig is concerned, everything seems to be operating smoothly. That's trouble. The trouble is two miles straight down. Down at the bottom of the drill hole, 10,000 feet below the surface, the drill pipe has broken off close to the drill bit. The broken pipe with a bit now has to be fished out of the drill hole. And so they send for a specialist, a specialist they call a fisherman. Meanwhile, the drilling pipe above the break, all 10,000 feet of it, must be removed disconnected and stacked aside. Whenever a broken pipe, drill bit, or anything else is lost down in the drill hole, it is nicknamed the fish. With the arrival of the fisherman, a specialist who makes his living by fishing in drill holes, a most unusual operation begins. The fisherman sizes up the only evidence available, the jagged edge of the broken drill pipe. He can't predict whether it'll take two days or two weeks, or even if he can catch the fish. But fish he will. It's that kind of a job. Three days and many fishing attempts later, they try another special fishing tool. Maybe this one will work, but they have no way of being certain. The trick is to make sure the tool is lowered the two miles directly over the fish. Down it goes in the end of 10,000 feet of pipe, expertly manipulated by the fisherman who has tons of massive machinery and equipment at his command. When he has the tool two miles down, he feels his way carefully, cautiously. He uses the gauges as his eyes, experience as his guide. Down, down it goes over the stuck fish until there it is, caught two miles underground. But will the tool hold the fish all the way up? Here's the payoff. Yes, the fish is caught. Our dry land fisherman has saved this $100,000 drilling investment. Now the drilling can continue to see if it strikes oil. Baby demands comfort, all right. And if he doesn't get it, a formal protest is soon registered. Every baby is a born expert as far as knowing what's good for him. He approves only the most gentle products expressly prepared for his well-being. Baby oil, for example. It is so pure and mild that during the infant period, it is often used instead of water for his bath. think that from this crude oil, pure baby oil is refined. But to extract baby oil and the hundreds of other useful products from petroleum after it is taken out of the ground requires as many as 10 different refining processes. A fantastic amount of investment, equipment, scientific skill, and complex engineering. 
competing oil companies spend over $150 million every year in progressive research just to develop and improve new products from petroleum for baby and the rest of us. a liquid boils, you just naturally think that it's hot. But this liquid can't be hot. It's sitting on a cake of ice, boiling on ice and vaporizing, producing a gas that burns. This unusual liquid is LP gas, one of the hundreds of products from petroleum. In many homes, it is one of our most useful handymen. It cooks our food, heats our water and our home, for the farmer, it can generate his power, warm his chicks, fuel his tractor, and control weeds through flame cultivation. And what of industrial uses? Well, LP gas serves, among other things, textile industries through drying processes. It can operate that workhorse of the factory, the forklift truck. and heat treat metals for a thousand industrial uses. LP gas prevents railroad switches from freezing and thus keeps the trains running. One important use is providing the cooking fuel for restaurants throughout the nation. Last year, six billion gallons of LP gas were transported and sold in the United States. Now, how would you transport this liquid fuel that boils well below the freezing point of water? The oil company solved the problem by developing specially built tank cars and tank trucks, permitting LP gas to be handled and stored in liquid form. One cubic foot of this amazing liquid becomes 300 cubic feet of vapor, which will do the work of 750 cubic feet of natural gas. A major achievement of the competing oil companies has been the development of techniques for successfully transporting and handling liquid fuel in great volume and at low cost. Here's a man who wears two hats. Of course, he's only wearing one hat now. That familiar one you see every time you drive into your neighborhood service station. Perhaps you've already found out he's one of the most conscientious citizens of your town. In addition to his regular occupation, he may be also a member of one of the reserve components of the armed forces. Another service station dealer might be a member of your local civil defense organization. Or one of those fire eaters on the volunteer fire department. Perhaps your dealer is an unpaid member of the Board of Education or serves on the Advisory Committee for Civic Improvement. Foreigners touring our country have commented many times that service station dealers are the most American Americans they meet. They say the dealers are cheerful and efficient. They reflect the freedom of opportunity we cherish so highly. That's why we say your neighborhood service station dealer is truly a man who is qualified to wear two hats. Here are some sick oysters. Just what made them sick and just how they are to be cured are questions that stumped an entire oyster industry. The trouble started down in Louisiana on the Gulf of Mexico where the Louisiana oyster fishermen claimed that oil production was killing off the local oyster population. The oil companies didn't agree, but they decided to look into the matter. So they started what developed into a $2 million oyster research program. Scientists went out to the bedding grounds where they collected buckets full of oysters and then brought them to a special oyster research center of Texas A&M College, one of the laboratories established for the oyster survey by the oil companies. 
in the research laboratory, every type of condition is created for the oyster patients. A blanket of crude oil is poured directly on the water. Water is jetted through oil for six months. Oil drilling mud was emptied into the water. Even dynamite charges were exploded near test oyster beds. Every possibility was explored. After years of study and progress, the results were in. The test oysters showed no ill effects from oil, even under conditions which far exceeded those ever present during oil production. As a matter of fact, the test oysters were so happy, they brought forth new generations to share their luck. They never had it so good. Well then, if this wasn't killing the oysters, what was? It took time and money to find out, and the scientists continued their progress. Oyster tissues were prepared for intensified examination and study. No possibility was overlooked. Finally, the real enemies are isolated. The most vicious villain of the lot is Dermocystidium marinum, a species of fungus that is bent on destroying the Louisiana oyster. It was further found that natural changes in the Gulf Coast and man-made improvements such as levees, together with climatic changes, were seriously affecting the proper mixture of fresh and salt water in the oyster bedding grounds. All of these factors were contributing to the reduction of oyster population. Now that the true causes were known, action could be taken. These major conclusions of the oyster research program are cheerfully turned over to the oyster industry. Why, you may ask, why were the results of two million dollars worth of research given to the oyster industry? It's because oil companies believe that maintaining good neighbors is just good business. As long as business and industry are free to lend a helping hand to each other, then everyone benefits.